And open course we're taping this class. If you don't want to be on camera, you have a right not to be on camera. We'll get to why you do later. Okay, in about two slides. And uh, just you should let Tom know. That's Tom and Alicia from OpenCourseWare. Okay, so in this class we're going to be talking about copyright and about the law. Because sometimes people talk about copyright in isolation, especially people who are really just interested in copyright. And in my opinion, that's a mistake. Because copyright is not really special. Uh, Congress passes lots of laws. They're like about corn subsidies or international trade or guns or you know all sorts of things. And copyright is really not special. So to understand copyright, you really have to understand the law, or at least the basics of the law. So today we're going to talk a bit about copyright, and then we're going to talk about American law in general. And some of you that might be kind of boring, but I, I think it's thrilling. Okay, so part one is about copyright. Who can tell me what this is from? <laughs> Should it be black? Who can tell me what that's from? The Constitution of what? The United, the United States. Now, is this what they wrote down when they created the United States? No. no. What, when did they write this? Like what year? 1789. Yeah, 1789. So they had already tried a little bit with the United States, and it didn't work out. Um, they had this other constitution. What was that called? The Articles of Confederation. And then... What did they do in 1789? Did they like amend the Articles of Confederation to change them because it wasn't working? They did have a convention, and they decided on this new constitution. And then what? How did? What did they do to the Articles of Confederation? They threw them out. They did what? They threw them out. They threw them out. Was that like a legal thing to do? Was that okay? Nope. No. So they they had a sort of revolution in 1789. A, a bloodless revolution. Um, and they're like, we don't like that old higher law. We're just going to adopt a new higher law. Did, could that happen today? Highly unlikely in the US. Why? It's established. But I mean, they had one in Ukraine, right? Just recently, they had a bloodless revolution. So it seems like the more that the rule of law gets established, the more difficult it is to just be like, let's try something different. So anyway, so in 1789, they're like, we're going to have a new covenant for uh, governing this nation, and this is going to be part of it. So what is this? What part of the Constitution is this from? Okay, what's Article 1 about? The Congress. Very good. Okay, and... And, and you can sit up there if you want. Has everybody gotten the little sheet? OK, can you sign the seat and then pass it back? OK, so we have a Congress. Can the Cong what's the Congress of Massachusetts? What's that called? The state legislature. And ours is called the General Court of Massachusetts. Um, and it, are there like limits on its power? Yeah. Yeah, so we have a Massachusetts Constitution, right? It's older than the U.S. Constitution. And it basically says the, the general court can, can do whatever it wants, subject to certain limitations. So if they want to stop you from you know, crossing the street on Mondays, they can do that. Is the U.S. Congress the same kind of thing? Can the U.S. Congress legislate however it wants, just subject to certain limitations? No. W why not? Is Trisha or okay. Katrina? Yeah, there's committees and subcommittees and stuff. So that does, that's sort of a bureaucratic impediment to them doing whatever they want. But is there a more structural impediment? Can, can the US Congress stop you from crossing the street on Mondays? Does anybody know? It cannot. Would uh, go against the uh, personal rights. Uh, I don't think that's true. I don't think there's a. Is there a personal rights clause of the U.S. Constitution? Well, I think 
Is there an amendment that protects your ability to cross the street on Mondays? Yes. So when the state set up this bloodless revolution in, in 1789, they were very concerned about centralized power. They had not too long ago been under a king who was horrible to them, and they wrote the Declaration of Independence. So they were very concerned about centralized power, and the states were very proud. There were states like, what's a real proud state? Let's try again. Virginia was a very proud state. Massachusetts was a very proud state. New York, they're probably all proud. Um, and, and they did not want to just cede arbitrary authority to the central national government. So they didn't do that. Uh, they established a federal government of enumerated powers. That's very important, that the federal government can only do what's set out in the Constitution. Congress can only do what's listed in Article I. So they have, what's, an ex, what's some examples of the Article I powers of Congress? To declare war, yeah. When's the last time they did that? World War II, yeah. What's another enumerated power of Congress? The levy taxes, yep. Post offices, okay. They've got a few enumerated powers, but there's there's a lot of th they can only do what fits one of the, in those enumerated powers. Can Congress stop you from growing pot in your backyard and then smoking it? Okay, that was a trick question. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, and that's very controversial. That's part of what people argue about on the Supreme Court. There's a, one of the things Congress can do is regulate commerce among the states. That's called the Interstate Commerce Clause. And uh, under that, uh, purportedly under that power, Congress has regulated uh, marijuana and, and other you know, drugs. Uh, and so they say you can't grow marijuana in your, in your backyard even if all you do is smoke it. Even if you, you don't give it to anybody, you certainly don't give it to anybody in another state. Congress has said no marijuana. And um, some of the states disagree. You know, California wants people to be able to smoke marijuana for medicinal purposes. And there's other places too. And they went to the Supreme Court and they said, look, federal government, you know, California's over here, the federal government's over here. They said, you have no business regulating people's marijuana in their backyards. That's our state. We regulate it. And we never ceded that authority to the federal government. And just because you have the power to regulate commerce between the states, among the states, that you can't stop me from growing pot in my backyard. And what did the Supreme Court say, like, last year? It said, yeah, right, Caitlin. It, it said, no, the federal government does have that power. That's within the interstate commerce power. Because if people were allowed to grow pot in their backyards, that would touch on interstate commerce. It would affect it eventually. So. The, the meanings of these clauses are not always uh, obvious. And there's people, um, you know, primarily uh, more conservative people, who think that, that the, the powers of the federal government have gotten way out of hand. And things like um, the Department of Education, which gives money to schools and, uh, and regulating marijuana, that these things are just not within the enumerated powers of Congress. Um, so th these are active debates. So here's one of the enumerated powers of Congress. And this is called, some people call it the Intellectual Property Clause. Does somebody want to read it? I'll read it. The Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So if there were no clause like this, could Congress set up copyrights? Possibly. Possibly. It's true. It's true. We don't really know. Uh, could Congress set up a law that says, um, if you invent something new, you can charge people for it forever? For limited time. So it has limited times. Does any other country? Now, the US is not the only country with copyright law, right? Does any other country have a constitutional limited times provision? Uh, well, no. No, some countries give perpetual rights. Uh, like in France, they have something called moral rights. And uh, those last forever. Uh, the, 
Somebody wanted to write, people know The Hunchback of Notre Dame, that was a, a Disney movie. And um, so somebody wanted to write a sequel to that book by Victor Hugo, and they're like, The Hunchback 2, Revenge of the Hunchback. <laughs> and uh, this is hundreds of years later, and Victor Hugo's heirs sued under the moral rights provision. They said, no, this impugns our moral rights. So um, not, in fact, I think yeah, no other country has a limited times provision in its constitution. We're the only one. Um, and that's, again, because the founders were very concerned about granting monopolies. Thomas Jefferson wrote, who was, Thomas Jefferson was maybe one of the most anti-copyright of the founders. And he wrote about how, you know, an idea is ephemeral. You know, I can take an idea and it doesn't take it away from you. So, you know, we don't need, we don't need these strict controls. And there were other founders who had, had different views who thought we need much more strict regulation. But... I'd like to strictly regulate this. Anyway, but we're the only country with a limited times provision. Uh, ha have there been any lawsuits recently about the limited times provision that anybody knows about? Yeah. Culture? Yeah. So what was in that? What happened there? Um, Eldred was, I believe, uh, what did Congress do? So con Congress ex extended the length of the Copyright Act, or the length of copyrights. Okay, so when we say limited times, oh shit, sorry. When we say limited times, how long is it these days? How limited is it? If you write something today, how long does it stay copyrighted? I think it's some sorry. number of decades beyond my death. Yeah, so you die, and then it stays in copyright for, what'd you say? 70 years for individuals. Um, did, was it always this way? No, it was shorter before. No, it was shorter before. So it used to be just 50 years after you died. And in 1998, uh, Congress went and they retroactively extended the length of copyright. There were things that were written in the 20s uh, that were about to no longer be copyrighted because it has to be for limited times. And uh, Congress says, we're going to go back and we're going to retroactively extend the length of those copyrights. So the heirs of, what's the book that was written in the 20s? The Great, Gatsby. the Great Gatsby. The heirs of F. Scott Fitzgerald, probably like, what, probably like uh, M.C. Fitzgerald, some, some heir. Uh, you know, they're, they're still getting royalties from the publication of The Great Gatsby. And that, you know, the grandchild probably wants the copyright to continue. So those dudes went to Congress and they said, we think that F. Scott Fitzgerald's copyright should continue, and Congress agreed. And they passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act in 1998, and it retroactively extended the terms of those copyrights. And what did Mr. Eldred say? Uh, he said that was unconstitutional. Yeah, why? Because, um, I'm not sure why. Yeah, the Supreme Court wasn't really sure either. But, uh, I mean, mostly because it says Congress has to do it for limited times. And they, if they can keep going back and retroactively extending it, Eldred argued, it, it's not limited because it can go forever. And furthermore, what was the other thing it said up there? So yeah, I know, I need to. Uh, but w Congress shall have the power to what? Sorry for the the pop quiz here, but Congress will have the power to promote science and useful arts, right? And, and how does extending a copyright promote science and useful arts? It doesn't? Yeah. A book so Financial expensive. Uh, well, okay. Okay, well, let's, let's get back to this later, but let's, I just want to emphasize that there's, you know, the, the provisions of the Constitution are important in America, and people can argue about just a few words. Um, like, what, is it, what does interstate commerce mean? What does limited times really mean? And we'll come back to that later. But there's some other countries where the, the Constitution, the literal text of the Constitution is not as important. Like, uh, is anybody here from, from the Soviet Union? So in the, have you read the Soviet Constitution? It's, uh, it's a majestic document. And it says things like, all, um, you know, all in the Soviet Union will have a right to free speech and the ability to criticize the government and the ability to practice any religion that they want. Um, you know, that was in the Soviet Constitution. But 
was that reality in the USSR? Not the religious part. I mean, if if the if you wanted to be baptized in the USSR, and the authorities came to you and said, you know, yet, could you sue the government for the right to be baptized? Yes, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, I mean, we have you know we have sort of a. It's it's not the universal practice that when a constitution has has appeals to high truths like uh, promote the progress of science and the useful arts, that that necessarily individual citizens can can claim the the protections of those um, words. And even in our constitution, that's not always the case. And Eldred went to the um, went to the Supreme Court and he says, uh, look, it doesn't promote the progress of science and the useful arts to give F. Scott Fitzgerald's grandchildren more money because the book has already been written. And the Supreme Court said, well, Congress isn't, th you know, it's not for us to decide if Congress is promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. So anyway, the point here is that the provisions of the Constitution matter, but, you know, you really have to, it's really not obvious just from looking at them what they really mean. Th this document is like 230 years old. People argue about it. There's all sorts of things written about it. So it's not... Um, you can't just pontificate about it and expect to have the Supreme Court agree with you. Okay. So what do all these have in common? It's all intellectual property. Has everybody heard of every one of these things? Not the last three. Okay. Um, but when people talk about intellectual property, this is intellectual property. What's, what's normal property? Like your house. Let's see what normal property is. Has anybody taken like economics? Like 1401? What's, what's property? full rights to use. Like, you can use this classroom. Is this classroom your property? Or, or like the fundamental theorem of calculus. Like, you can use that, but it's, it's not your property. Anything you can sell. Uh, that's closer. Something that can be involved in a transaction between parties. Something that can be involved in the transaction. I mean, you can have a divorce, right, and and grant custody to one of children to one parent or another. But the children are not really property, are they? Property is uh, the right of uh, many users, abusers, and uh, fructus, which is uh, the right to use, the right to deny the use, and the right to benefit uh, from the uh, from it. Oh, that's good. Use, deny the use. Where'd you get that from? Uh, from the uh, course of the academy in France. In France. See, at my French, I learned like who said that? Yeah, he was French too. I know, but he was never any. Okay, so property is one theft or two these things. <laughs> That's the French views. Um, uh, who who agrees with number one? Not even the Russia guy. I guess. Okay. Yeah, I mean. Like, like, use, deny, use, and right to guard is kind of an inclusive. Like, if you steal something, right? And you can use it, you can deny it, somebody else will take it back. And you can benefit from it. No, it's not the same. Right to it. It's not the right. 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 It's
Um, well, okay, here's Black's Law Dictionary. It says, property, that which is peculiar or proper to any person, that which belongs exclusively to one. In the strict legal sense, an aggregate of rights which are guaranteed and protected by the government. So Black's, legal dictionary, or Black's Law Dictionary says property, property has to do with what the government will protect. So I, he, B Mr. Black doesn't really seem to agree with, with Proudhon. So um, we're more going to talk about this notion of property in class. So do people agree with that, that property is the set of rights that the government will protect? What if like, the government doesn't protect your right? Like saying that corporations want to build something there and they kick people off? Yeah. And was that really your property? Like, I mean, and, and like they tax you while you're they tax you, yeah. Yeah? There was a debate uh, for the, the French first constitution uh, whether the government should protect property because, on, on one hand, it would be uh, granted that it would be protected, but on the other hand, uh, well, it, it could uh, lessen this right because it, it could be limited in some view. And finally, uh, it was agreed that. Uh, property rights should not be uh, protected by its government uh, because it's a natural right. It's a natural right. So are they in today in France protected by the government? I don't remember. I mean, if I trespass on your land, the government will come and arrest me, right, even in France? Yeah. Okay. So, um, but we also talked about how property rights are limited, like you talked about taxes. What about if I own uh, if I own a house in in Boston? Um, can an airplane fly over my land? Yes. Sure. 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 Well, Do they have the right to pay? To Do I have the right to demand payment from them? Can I? Let's say a, a burglar goes on my land. Can I threaten to shoot them if they don't leave? And if they don't leave, can I shoot them? In the south. <laughs> <laughs> Let's 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 yeah. Let's say the answer is yes. I have the right to exclude a burglar from my property. Uh, but an airplane flying overhead, can I exclude the airplane from my property? Yeah. Because uh, the air above your property is not uh, doesn't belong to your property. Oh sure it does. If somebody wants to string a telephone wire above my property or an electrical wire, a limited height. Where would, where would you find the limited height? Like in your in your deed, like if you own real property, you know you go to the county register and you want to buy a house, you you get a deed and it says we give you this parcel of land, it's now yours and it's recorded. It doesn't have a height limit. Uh, at least in, in France, it, uh, this, this right of property is limited in uh, to some height above the ground or above the, the highest point and to uh, some point below the, the level of the ground. Okay. When we moved into our house, we had a tree in the backyard, and the branches kind of went over the neighbor's heart. And they wanted us, like, they had this lady come to our house tell us they had air rights to their house, and that we should cut our tree down because the branches were in their yard, and it was like being all air property. So I don't know if that was real or not, but my dad told us there's six rooms of them. <laughs> 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 but, like, the fact that they came to actually argue air rights, you know, just kind of. Yeah. So, so one notion here is that even if you own property and it's as good as gold like your house, that, that, that ownership is subject to limitations. It can be taxed by the government. They can come and say, we've decided your house is worth a million dollars, so we're going to tax you $10,000 a year. And if you don't pay your property taxes, you're out. So it's limited in that sense by taxation. She brought, what's your name? Shirley. It's Shirley brought up. Uh, it's limited in that you can't stop an airplane from flying over. Now, when airplanes first started, the property owner said, look, if you want to fly over the route that's above my house, we need compensation. Oh, here's another example. Let's say the government's building a new highway, and it wants to go through my land. Can they just build the highway through my land? They can use eminent domain. So that's another way in which my property right is limited. The government can take my land. Can they just take it and be like, Poo, like the empire will compensate you for your time? So what is eminent domain? Take your property um, 
if there's for public use. They can take your property for public use, and do they just have, do they have to do anything to compensate you? Yeah, they have to compensate you. But this is another sense in which your property is, is limited. And the, and the air rights, um, when airplanes first started, the property owners went to uh, the courts. And they said, look, if they want to build an air highway above my house, that's just like building a highway or a telephone line or an electrical line. I need, at the minimum, compensation. And, uh, and, and the, the courts, I think even the Supreme Court, said, no, we don't think that's part of your property right. But that was a case of, you know, the Supreme Court had never seen that before. So sometimes it's not even obvious what your property right is or isn't. But this definition here is a, it's a pretty mainline definition. But people get very passionate about it. That's my property, so you can't do anything. I mean, property is limited all the time. And let's just briefly, so, okay, so these, are, these are the kinds of property that we could call intellectual property. What distinguishes this from sort of normal property? It's not physical. Okay. Can you, can you take somebody's, um, you know, right of publicity so they don't, let's, can you take somebody's copyright so that they don't have their, if I copy your book, does it take the book away from you? Is there any limit on the number of copies of the book? I mean, if you have some sheep and I take your sheep, that means you don't have them anymore. But if I copy your book, do you still have the book? You'll lose the deny to use. That's true. Yeah, you'll lose the right to deny to use them. Okay, so how do we, um, has anybody had this book? So how do we classify these, damn it. How do we, um, how do we talk about the different kinds of property rights? Has anybody taken economics? What about like national defense? You have a, you know, the government protects you whether you want them to or not. What kind of, uh, you know, what kind of good is that? A what? A public good. Let me get to the page here. Okay, and why is it a public good? There's this classification of goods. What's something like a sheep that you own? How would we classify that? It's private, okay. And why is it private? I can't hear you. You're the only one that benefits from it, and what else? People heard of rivalry? No? Is there a rivalry for the, let's say we have a cow and it produces a certain amount of milk per day. Is there a, you know, if it produces a gallon of milk per day, or how much milk does a cow produce? 40 gallons a day. How much? 40. 40 gallons a day, okay. So if I sell somebody 20 gallons, can I sell somebody else 30 gallons? No, no, there's a limit. <laughs> so there's what's called a rivalry to the resource. Because there's a, if somebody wants 30 gallons, then the only amount somebody else could have is 10 gallons. And what else about a cow? Is there any way for me to stop you from milking my cow? Yeah. Is it, is it possible? Yeah, you can fence it off, you can hire farm hands. So I can enforce my right to the milk from the cow. So the cow has exclusivity. So rivalry means there is contention between different people who want the good. Exclusivity means it's possible to enforce exclusivity. It's not a good definition at all. <laughs> There's exclusion. I can exclude people from using it. Try that. Okay. What's a right that has a good that has exclusion but but and rivalry? This one, right? Like the cow. What's one that has um, no rivalry, but it does have exclusion? Like crossing the bridge. Like crossing, 
crossing a bridge. That's good. So like a toll. So they can stop you from crossing the bridge if you don't pay the toll. But there's really not no contention for the bridge. At least not, you know, it's a, it's a pretty far off contention. Or like uh, cable TV. Like they can stop you from getting HBO. But there's no limit on the number of people they can give HBO to. So these things are called private goods. Uh, so a no, or sorry, yes and no. OK, so here's an example of something that's with exclusion but not rivalry is like, it's called a public good, like cable TV. What's something that has no exclusion but it does have rivalry? Yeah, like a river or a, a highway, something where it can get congested. Like a free highway, you know, with no, if they don't have a toll booth, they can't stop you from accessing the highway. But if too many people access the highway, we've got problems. So that's called a common access resource. And what's this last category where there's no rivalry and there's no exclusion? Well, how about, well, clean air is a good one. If the air is clean, you know, I can breathe the clean air, you can breathe the clean air. And there's no way to exclude, you know, if, we, if, we, if the government is paying to clean up the air, whether I pay those taxes or not, I still benefit from it. There's, if people read Atlas Shrugged, is anybody here a, a, an objectivist? So Ayn Rand was this author, and she wrote this book, Atlas Shrugged, about a very... Uh, sort of free market view of how the world should work. And only people who want the services of the police should have to pay for the police protection. And the same for ambulances and fire departments and, and national defense. But it, in practice, it, it would be tricky to have an, an army that only protected the people who were paying for its services. Right? Like if an army protects Cambridge, Massachusetts, it can't only protect the people who are paying for the army. Right? Either it's going to ward off the attackers or it isn't. So sort of national defense is another one. Yeah. Uh, let's say either. I mean, because the you know if the government is willing to enforce an exclusive right, I mean they do it physically. They've got FBI and guns, and so that's you know a legal mechanism eventually becomes a physical one. I mean, the bullet might be the first time there's an actual physical thing, but it, they eventually um, it, it's eventually physical. Okay, so, so these species of intellectual property, what kinds of goods do they, do they protect? Like a copyright, like when you get Microsoft Windows, that's copyrighted, right? Somebody else is like, hey, can you give me a copy of Windows? Can you, can you dupe it for them? Or the Britney Spears? If I buy a Britney Spears CD and somebody's like, hey, can you give me a copy of that? What, what kind of good is the, first of all, is that illegal? Yes. I mean, yes. Let's say yes. So what, what kind of good is a Britney Spears CD? The music on the Britney Spears CD. Well, public good. Public good. Because there's no rivalry to the music. You, if, you, if I put the Britney Spears MP3 in my home directory, you know, anybody can get it. It's not like, it doesn't take it away from me. So... It, it, one, one reason that these kinds of property rights are intellectual property rights is because what they protect are public goods. Now, what's a, what's a pure public good in the area of copyrighted stuff? Yeah, so free software. So like Linux. Somebody puts, you know, Linux is an operating system kernel. If somebody puts that on the internet and says, take it, do whatever you want with it then not only is there no rivalry, but there's also no exclusion, because anybody can take it. But, but most, most music and software is just not, it's not a, so this is called a pure public good. So Linux is, you know, is pure, but uh, most copyrighted materials are just public goods. And that's why we, we say that these rights are intellectual property rights, because what they protect, there's no rivalry. If 
I copy the Britney Spears CD, it doesn't take the Britney Spears CD away from you. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. But there's no one thing called intellectual property. There's a lot of different laws. So what can somebody explain in one sentence what's a copyright? Two sentences? This is like that game. Similar to my number two, the deny the use. Okay, but but just somebody like what's a you know what's a copyright? What does that protect? It's really more specific. It, it, copyright is it about an expression like a book, some sort of write you know some sort of writing or a movie, and it it says you can't copy it. You can't copy a movie without permission from the owner of that property right. You can't copy a book. It's basically what copyright is about. But if we see, um, what's a good movie, like Jurassic Park, and, uh, and then I want to make my own movie about dinosaurs, is that, can the, who, who owns the copyright on Jurassic Park? Some company, yeah, Universal. So can Universal stop me from making another movie about dinosaurs? Well, but no. They don't own the idea of dinosaur movie. They own this expression, the movie Jurassic Park, and you can't copy that. That's a copyright. Okay, what's a patent? Sorry? You were close. You were there. Say it again. It's for an invention. So if you invent something, like if you make the first dinosaur movie, If you make the, or if you invent um, a drug, penicillin, um, it stops somebody else from, from selling the same invention, right? Or from even making the same invention. So could you patent a dinosaur movie? Just the idea of a dinosaur movie? You could patent a lot of, you could patent a lot of things, that's true. Does it have to be non-obvious? It does have to be non-obvious. So, but, so there's a difference between copyrights and patents. Copyrights protect things that are like written down, or like a movie, and stop you from copying them. Uh, but patents protect inventions, and they stop you from making them, or using them, or selling them. We're not going to talk about patents anymore in this class, but they're different from copyrights. But they're also sort of intellectual property. Um, what's a trade secret? Like Coca-Cola, yeah. Is that patented? Like, if I discover the formula for Coca-Cola, can Coke sue me and say that's our invention? No, because it's not. It's not patented. It's just. It's a secret. And if I went to Coke and I said, "I want to make Coca-Cola. I'll give you a trillion dollars to let me make Coca-Cola," could they sell me the right to do that? Sure, but it's their secret. And a pat. Sorry. I was just wondering what separates, like, you know, a patent. If, if, if your, your secret was an invention. Yeah. Well, one of the differences is that a, a patent is sort of a deal. You have, to dis, you have to publish your invention to get a patent. And then it only lasts 20 years. A trade secret, uh, you keep secret. You don't publish. And it lasts forever. But if somebody ever finds out about it or comes up, invents it on their own, then they can do whatever they want. A patent, even if they do it on their own, they're still screwed. Okay, what's a trademark? Yeah. Uh, do yeah. Yeah. Like if you steal a trade secret, uh, the a government can can prevent you from telling anybody else about it. No. But no, you don't. But you need if you want the courts to enforce it, you need to show evidence that you had some agreement to keep it secret. Okay, what's a trademark? Okay, let, let, we can write this little, so, well, anyway, what's a trademark? A brand. Like a brand, like Disney. Or what's, a, what's an, another example of a trademark? Coca-Cola. How about rated PG-13? That's a trademark. 
Like if I want to put out a movie that's got like people's limbs coming off and all sorts of nude people and everything, and I say rated G, is that okay? <laughs> Can I do that? No, why not? Right, so there's an organization called the Motion Picture Association, and they own a trademark on rated G. So you can't pretend that they, that they endorsed your movie with rated G if, it, if they didn't. Okay, so copyright, if we had to sum up in just a few words, copyright is a right to prevent people from copying. Patents is a right to prevent people from making or using or selling an invention. Trade secret, just it's a secret. <laughs> it's about all you get. And you, can, you have a right to keep it secret, uh, as long as somebody doesn't find out about it legitimately. A trademark is a right to prevent confusion in a consumer. So if I, if I make a, um, a movie called The Little Mermaid Sucks and Disney is a Horrible Company. Now, Disney has a trademark on Disney, right? Can they sue me and win? Yes? Well, well not, not there. Yeah, I mean, basically, unless my product would create a likelihood of confusion, they can't win. That's what a trademark is. If I say Disney endorses my product and they don't, that's trademark infringement. But if I say Disney sucks, it's probably not trademark infringement. Who here has heard the song Barbie Girl by uh, who wrote it? Aqua, yeah. People know that song? Do people think that Mattel was happy with the song? What does it say about Barbie? Derogatory. It's derogatory told Barbie. It's, she's sort of a loose woman. As depicted in the song, she's sort of a loose woman. Um, and, and Barbie, uh, Mattel, the company that owns the trademark on Barbie, sued Aqua and its record label, saying this CD is trademark infringement because customers will believe that it comes from us. And that's what, that's what you have to assert to, to win a case for trademark infringement. You have to assert a likelihood of confusion. Uh, and uh, it was a very long case. It's, it's fun to read. Maybe we'll, I, I won't. Anyway, it's a fun case. You can pull it up. And uh, how are we doing on time? OK. And, uh, and the court had to go through, and they surveyed people in shopping malls. And they said, here's Barbie. Here's this song. Do you think the song comes from the same company that made the doll? And they interview people, and a certain percentage say yes. And, some percentage say no, and the court has to decide whether there's a likelihood of confusion. And in this case, the court, you know, because Mattel wrote, for instance, that Barbie, they had worked hard to cultivate Barbie's image, uh, which was wholesomeness. And that this song destroyed the, you know, made it look like Mattel was now coming out with a new image for Barbie. And uh, anyway, the court didn't buy it, and it went to the appeals court, and the appeals court didn't buy it. But th the point is, that's what you need for a trademark. You need to have likelihood of confusion. But when you see those infomercials and they say, this vacuum works great, and you know, the Bissell vacuum sucks, and the, um, or doesn't suck, and the, uh, the Auric vacuum also is really bad, is it OK to use those companies' names and that sort of comparative advertising? Yes, it is. Okay. So a trademark is not an exclusive right to use the name Disney. It's a right to prevent likelihood of confusion, generally about the origin of products. Okay, what's a right of publicity? You all just signed this away, so uh, it would be good to know about it. Sorry? OK, well, you didn't sign it away. Right, a right of publicity is a right to protect your identity from being used generally in advertising, in commercial speech. So if somebody's filming like a, it's maybe broader than that, but if somebody's filming a movie, like Steven Spielberg's filming a movie outside, and they accidentally get you in the shot, um, they generally would not want to publish the movie without having you sign a waiver. Now, what if the Channel 7 News is filming at something outside a nightclub, let's say a, a nightclub of ill repute, and they catch you in the shot? Um, would they be infringing your right of publicity to publish that photograph? Yeah, well, they wouldn't. Um, because the right of publicity only protects your identity in, in sort of commercial publications. So the news is, is excluded. Sort of factual material is excluded. But um, so that, you know, that if you take a picture out on the street um, just of random people and put it on your web page, 
that's okay. But if you take a picture out on the street and you know Nikon wants to use that picture in their advertising for the camera, that's totally not okay. They have to get what are called model waivers from all those people. So that's the right of publicity. And uh, it's quite broad, actually. In, uh, in California, this company, Samsung, which makes televisions, made an advertisement about, in the future, Samsung televisions will still be running. And they showed some of the things that would be on your Samsung television in the year 3000. And they had a robot wearing like a blonde wig, turning over some letters. You know, it was like, like in Wheel of Fortune. But it, it was a robot, you know, they're like, in the future, you know, a robot will turn over the blonde letters, the, turn over the letters. And they were sued by, what's her name? Vanna White. The woman who in real life turns over the letters on Wheel of Fortune. They said, no, by having this robot in a blonde wig, your, you, your company is profiting from my identity, you know, with my... And um, anyway, and, and she won. She won like $400,000. <laughs> so the, the right of publicity is very broad, uh, at least in some parts of the country. And it's a right to have your identity not be exploited commercially. But from the news, you don't have any protection. Okay, there's another kind of intellectual property right called a, the orphan drug protection that we have in America, where if you're a, a drug company and you make a, um, a drug for a rare disease, uh, even if it, the drug doesn't have any novel inventions in it, you don't have a patent, still, you're the only company that's allowed to sell the drug for, I think, seven years. So it's another sort of limited property right. And finally, what's a designation of origin? You should know. Uh, it's, uh, it's the right to benefit from uh, the peculiarity of uh, the region where you are doing some product, let's say cheese or wine or yeah. something else. So in Europe, they're very serious about this thing called designation of origin. And if you want to have uh, like champagne, sparkling wine, or uh, what's, a, what's a cheese example? Anyone? Uh, Emmental or Emmental cheese or cheddar. So, you know, the idea is that only those towns, the place, Champagne in France or Bordeaux or those places would be able to call their wines or their cheeses by those names. And that's a designation of origin that would be owned by those localities. And uh, in America, we've really resisted. I don't think we have protections for designation of origins. So you can get Champagne that's actually from California or cheddar cheese that's from Wisconsin. But uh, in Europe, they, they don't like that stuff. So that's an example of an intellectual property right that exists in some countries, but not in America. And there's other ones, too, like those moral rights we were talking about don't really exist in the US. Um, so when people start talking about intellectual property, it's, it's important to realize that those words reflect a broad set of rights imposed by different government agencies that are different in different states and different countries, and they're, they can be very particular. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not property, because as we learned, all sorts of property can be hemmed in, and the airplanes, and the, the burrowing, and taxes, and all that. But th these rights, too, can be very particular, and they often, different intellectual property rights have nothing to do with each other. Um, now, you know, are these rights property? You know, I mean, like, if you own a sheep, there's no really limit on the time that you can own the sheep. But copyrights and patents, there are limited times. Some people argue that they're not property. You can see here in the law, Congress actually said, you know, patents are personal property, ditto for copyright. And some scholars disagree that copyrights are really property. Um, here's what 46 law professors wrote in 2001. Somebody want to read that out loud? patents and copyrights, as they could have easily done, more precisely to promote the progress of science and useful arts. This grant incorporates and enforces a specific vision of the sorts of exclusive rights that are permitted. Rights limited not only in duration, see U.S. Constitution Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, but also in scope. These rights are not property rights, again, terminology which the framers knew well and could easily have chosen, and which is powerful natural law antecedents, the limited monopolies to be prescribed by statute. Okay, so what does that mean? Limited monopolies to be prescribed by statute. How is that different from property? Yeah. Okay. Into product you and these monopolies are supposed to 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 benefit society in fact. 
And okay. It's only because it, uh, it will benefit you from a certain amount of time that you, you will have the incentive to, uh, to make discoveries or uh, to publish uh, new uh, books, for example. Okay, so, so these rights are to give you an incentive to publish new books. Because if I publish this book, I know I'll be able to benefit from it for at least the next 70 years. Nobody will rip me off. And, uh, and that's not like property. I mean, do we buy that? Who, who thinks that that's true, that this, this argument is persuasive? Copyright is not a, a property right. Does anybody agree with the 46 law professors? What's the context of university students? We'll get to that. It was a lawsuit. Uh, but the issue here was, is copyright a property right? And the, the 46 law professors, including Jonathan Zittrain, at Har or not at Harvard anymore, at Oxford now, said, no, it's not a property right. But does anybody agree with them? I don't agree with more the uh, copyright stuff because what I'm used to uh, the more uh, property. But uh, for the patents, I would tend to agree. Yeah, Katrina? They're just saying that pretty much the copyright is there to promote parts. But like, hypothetically, if you loved what you did anyway, you wouldn't care who copied you or who used your stuff just because you want to create because you feel the urge to need to create. This is more or less like, I want to benefit from what I'm doing. It is definitely a problem if you talk. Because, I mean, you know, if you just wanted to make music, you wouldn't care. But you just make the music for your thing. Because you benefit really from it anyway. But so you disagree with the 46 law? Oh, okay. definitely. Okay. I mean, I would be a little... I mean, I'm not a law professor, so I would normally defer to what these guys say. I took copyright from Jonathan Zittrain, so normally I would want to defer to him. But really, nobody agrees with those guys. And women. I mean, they were. Um, OK, anyway, well, I don't even really know what they meant. Because as we've learned, property rights are limited. Uh, and they are often prescribed by statute. Like if there's a statute that says that your air rights only uh, extend up so far. So to say that it's a limited monopoly to be prescribed by statute, that could be property. And as we read here in Black's Law Dictionary, property, in the strict legal sense, an aggregate of rights which are guaranteed and protected by the government. This term is said to extend to every species of valuable right and interest. So I don't really know what they meant. Later, I was in his Jonathan Zittrain's, Professor Zittrain's class, and he was talking about property. And I was like, but you said copyright is not property at all. It's a limited monopoly to be prescribed by statute. And he was like, <laughs> um, anyway, do you think the law professor's side of this case won, by the way? Uh, Corley. No, they didn't win. Uh, good. Wow, we're really. Uh, she says good. So we really don't like Proudhon in this class. The law professors are kind of more like this. Well, OK. But, OK. Anyway, but I think this is thought provoking because we have to, you know, the question is what is Congress doing? Why are they doing it? Um, so do, do people, do, do you believe, Katrina, that copyright does create an incentive that does promote progress of science and useful arts? I think in some cases, just general underline, yeah, I could. Like, this is not just like a bogus BS argument they pulled out of nowhere. This is, I mean, hypothetically, it could be true. But I think if you look at the way society works, that's not really the case at all. Okay. Well, it helps to make your livelihood off of something like art, which would be more difficult if it wasn't protected so many. Yeah. Right. Right. Do we think Jurassic Park would have been made without copyright? All those people had to work for so long on building the sets and that dinosaur robot and uh, the mask and drawing the sketches and the storyboards. and the, you know, All those people had to work for years and years and years to make the movie. Do we think that that movie could have been made without copyright? Well, how would they pay for the sets and the dinosaur robot? But you're saying they want to make a livelihood off of it. Right? People would pay to see it? So she says if it's good enough, people would pay to see it. But why would they pay you to see it? Why wouldn't they pay some other dude? I mean, why wouldn't they pay whoever could show it to you for the cheapest? Has anybody ever been to New York City? Have you seen the bootleggers? 
Those guys are so efficient at getting movies to you. It's amazing. They're out there, you know, like the day after the movie is out. The, even before the movie is out, those guys are out there on Times Square. Hey, man, do you want some movies? And they, they've got like a mil any movie you could want, and it's like a buck each. Those guys are very efficient. So if Jurassic Park came out and you really wanted to see it, you could buy it from those dudes. You wouldn't have to pay the set painters and the dinosaur robot makers. So I'm not sure if I really buy that. Do you think that retroactively extending the copyright on The Great Gatsby in 1998, saying The Great Gatsby is going to continue being copyright for the next 20 more years, did that promote the progress of science and useful arts? Does anybody think so? What about like poor high school students who can't buy it for a buck? Yeah. So there's a sort of balance to be had here. Uh, some argue, like if, if the Great Gatsby were protected for too long, we would not be promoting the progress of science and useful arts. Is that what we think? I think the argument there is that Scott Fitzgerald only knew that he would get copyright for 50 years after his death, and the extra 20 years was not an incentive to him to write. Okay, that's it. so that's sort of a contract theory, that he wrote it with the understanding that he would get copyright for 50 years after his death. And that's the deal. That's how he okay. Okay, so, and he already wrote it, the book. So the fact that we're later giving him a sweeter deal, uh, you know, can't possibly bear on whether he's going to write the book in the first place because he already wrote it. In fact, he's already dead. Okay, so that's one argument. So in that view, would Congress have been promoting the progress of science and useful arts? Would Congress have constitutionally been able to retroactively extend the copyright? Yeah. Other people might think, oh, if I write a book tomorrow, maybe 100 years after my death, they'll extend that. So it might actually create more incentive for people to do that for some. OK. Frankly, yeah. I don't feel that incentivized about the wealth of my great-great-grandchildren. I, guess, I mean, I guess maybe that's kind of cruel to those as yet non-existing heirs. But I think it's uh, easier to see on the patents, because if you didn't have any uh, property right on patents, you wouldn't make any research to, to, uh, to create inventions, because it cost you money. And then everybody would be uh, able to copy you and uh, to sell it for uh, cheaper. On the other hand, if it was a perpetual protection, then well, it would not promote research because those great companies would have a limited right to to sell some old inventions. They they would not have to to make some more research. They have they would have benefits forever. Okay. So in that view, the 20 years of patent becomes a critical question. You, 10 years might be too short, and 50 years might be too long. Maybe 20 years is too short or too long. No, we have a problem because uh, since the research uh, becomes longer and longer, uh, there is a problem of uh, when do you patent something before it's uh, finished? Uh, be, uh, before. How many years before you, you can uh, begin to say? Okay. I actually don't, I don't want to get too much into patents because it's not really my field. Um, but so copyright, it seems like we're sort of, do people think there needs to be limited times for copyright? What if it were just forever? Would that be OK? Okay. Like seven years after death. Seven years after death. It's a really, really long time, so. That's true. So I mean, it's basically, you could say it's basically forever now, and we're not doing too bad. Uh, in fact, this, the, the representative who, who proposed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, does anybody know who that was? Who was Sonny Bono? Yeah, Sonny and Cher. He was some sort of singer. Anyway, his wife, Mary Bono, I guess his wife was not Cher, or anyway, his wife, <laughs> Mary, she's not Cher Bono. Mary Bono, the representative in Congress. I think Sonny Bono was in Congress, and then he died, and Mrs. Bono took over her seat, and she proposed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, and she says, I think copyright should last forever. Uh, but apparently, for some reason, we can't do that, so we're going to make it last forever minus a day is what she said. So they made it 70 years after death. But it doesn't seem like the world would fall if it were forever, right? 
And so the Supreme Court heard this argument that retroactively extending copyrights on works that have already been written where the authors are already dead does not promote the progress of science and the useful arts. That was the argument from Eldred. And the counter-argument from the movie studios was, look, there's these old movies, they're out of copyright now, and so we don't have any incentive to restore them. Um, but if, we, if they were brought back into copyright or kept in copyright, then we, in, in 1998, we would now have an incentive to restore those old movies. And so there, it does promote the progress of science and useful arts to retroactively extend work, um, the copyright on works already created because it gives us an incentive in the present day to restore these old works. That was the argument, and it, it carried the day. Uh, and so the Supreme Court says, we don't think retroactively extending the copyrights is unconstitutional. Okay. But it, you know, it's important to keep in your mind, like what is the overarching goal of this uh, whole scheme? And, okay. So let's talk about what copyright actually is. Copyright is a bundle of rights, the law professors say. I hope not just those 46 law professors. Lots of law professors. Copyright is a bundle of rights. What does that mean? I mean, is owning, is owning your house a bundle of rights? I mean, yes, you can exclude people from the house. You can, uh, you can build on that land. You can charge money. OK. So, but copyright also is a bundle of rights. And in, uh, in the copyright law, which Congress has written, and we'll get to the different kinds of laws later, Congress has written exactly what that bundle of rights are. Does somebody want to read this? Somebody other than uh, Hung Yi? Darren? <laughs> OK. Just start at number, oh, OK, start here. Under the title has the exclusive rights. The exclusive rights. So that means nobody else can do these things. Only me. To do and to authorize. Okay, so me and the people I authorize. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the following. Okay, one. To reproduce the copyrighted work in copies or photo, photo records. Photo records. So one, only I can copy the thing. Two, to prepare derivative works based upon the copyrighted work. Okay, what's a derivative work? Really? Like a sequel? Yeah. Okay, a sequel is a good example. What's another kind of a derivative work? A song uses the same melody. That's good. A song uses the same melody. Like, um, dun, 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 dun. what was that one? <laughs> Under pressure became ice ice baby. Okay. What's another? What's a more traditional derivative work? How about translations? Like when I write, you know, Proudhon wrote in, fr in French, but it's been translated into English. So that's a derivative work. And authors are, you know, control their translation rights. What's another kind of derivative? Well, what about, uh, have people seen um, Clueless? What work of literature is that based on? Emma. By who? Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Okay. So is Clueless a derivative work of Emma? Have, who, who here has not seen Clueless? OK, or Bridget Jones' Diary. Have people seen that movie? OK. I think the more relevant question is who hasn't read him. <laughs> That'll be a sign later in the class. OK, uh, so, so but Clueless, it's this movie about uh, Alicia Silverstone. And she's in Beverly Hills, and it's really funny. But it's based on this book, Emma, by Jane Austen. So somebody who's seen the movie and read Emma, is Clueless a derivative work of Emma? Or West Side Story? Uh, is that a derivative work of Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare? No, I wouldn't say so. You wouldn't say so. Okay. It's the same plot. That's true. But then again, like, it's a pretty common yeah, plot. It's, it's not a <laughs> like Shakespeare plot. could have pulled his plots from something out. And he did, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And like all of those events are not. Like a specific, say like Jurassic Park, right? Like that's a very specific like storyline. Romeo and Juliet is very general. What's happened for centuries, kind of argument. Okay, but it's we're not really sure. So we're already we're on number two, and we don't really know what it means to prepare derivative works. Uh, in fact, there's this book, Gone with the Wind, which is written from the perspective. Have people actually read the book? 
Yeah, is it a first person book or a third person book? It's written basically from the perspective of Scarlett O'Hara, right? Let's say yes. So <laughs> somebody else wrote a book called, it, this is just a few years ago, called The Wind Done Gone, which was, written, <laughs> which was written from the perspective of one of the slaves in the book. And it was a sort of creative retelling. And uh, was that a derivative work? Well, they went to court on that one. And there's another case with Lolita, where uh, somebody wrote a version of Lolita that was written from the perspective of Lolita. And was that a, you know, who knows? So it's already sensitive, what it means to prepare to work. And the courts have written voluminous material about this. Um, who here has written a computer program? And what operating system did you write the program on? OK, let's try somebody else. <laughs> How about you? What did you write it on? Me? Sure. Uh, Linux. <laughs> OK, Linux. OK, and how, did you print anything in your program? And what did you use to print? Um, I'm usually just printing to the screen. So did, what like function did you use? You, you probably used something that uses this, right? Printf or something like that? Or was it in Java? Or OK, so then you used something called like println or something? System out println, something like that? OK. So, Println calls this thing printf, and who wrote this thing called printf? I think it was this guy named Ulrich, who also wrote the Coke machine in my laboratory, the computerized Coke machine. Ulrich Drepper. Let's, let's say yes. <laughs> so this is part of something called the GNU C library, uh, and it's this other program written by some other guy, and it's really complicated, and it's not easy to write printf. I don't know if you've tried. Not easy. So was Liz's program a derivative work of printf? A, a program by Ulrich? Could Ulrich Drepper be like, Liz, you ripped me off. You prepared a derivative work of my program. I mean, let's, let's say he released it like you released, you know, Gone with the Wind. Yeah. I think the, um, the derivative work uh, would, be, would have a very, very uh, few DOC compared to what had been used. Uh, uh, what exists in my material <coughs> as a medium. You have to make a trade of what exists. Well, let's say I just write this program. Printf, hello. Let's say we're on Windows. And I say printf, hello. So that calls a different version of printf written by, let's say it's written by Bill Gates. Um, can I release, you know, can I give this program away or is it a derivative work of printf by Bill Gates? So you say it's a derivative work. Does anybody disagree? You think I can't release this program without Bill Gates' permission? Because Bill Gates has the exclusive right to authorize the preparation of a derivative work of his printf. Yeah. I mean, I think if you use a library like that, like you get the permission to use it. That's what it's made for. So. I mean, you're just using it to some extent. Yeah, well, the, anyway, the cons the the. Nobody knows the answer to these questions. The generally, the safe answer is is yes. If you link, uh, you know, if you link with a library, you are preparing a derivative work. So anyway, I just want to emphasize that derivative works can arise in all sorts of unusual contexts. Let's say you um, you have a web page. Keith's homepage. Keith rules. I have this web page, and I use frames. And I tell the browser in the top, put my text, and in the bottom, put, um, you know, Google's search page. Have I prepared a derivative work? Or, or have you prepared a derivative work by loading this page? Maybe you're the guilty one. So we, we just don't know, right? This was a litigated issue. Uh, that one is going to be litigated at some point in the future. But you know, these are hard questions. So just want to just in, this is the how how long is the copyright law? It's like 300 pages of the. So just want to and, and anyway, we're, we're at the very beginning of it, and I already want to emphasize there's very very difficult subtleties. Okay, let's go on three. Distributed copies or 
Total records of the copyrighted work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending. To distribute copies of, of the book. So if I'm like, here's my Black's Law Dictionary, and you're like, can I borrow it? I'm like, sure, here you go. Borrow my Black's Law Dictionary. <laughs> you know, have we broken the law right now? I'm lending it to you? Who, I mean, Mr. Black has the exclusive, or what's it say in there, LexisNexis or something? Mr. Nexus has the exclusive right to authorize lending that book, and I just lent it to you without his permission. Did I break the law? Yes? Well, <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> because later in the copyright law, there's an exception. And in fact, this is true for everything in the copyright law. There's exceptions <laughs> to everything. So anyway, it, it, go on. Four. In the case of literary, musical, dramatic, or choreographic works. What's a choreographic work? It's like a dance that's written down. Pantomimes and motion pictures or, and other audiovisual works to perform the copyrighted work publicly. To perform the copyrighted work publicly. So when you go to LSC and they show a movie, uh, is that performing a copyrighted work publicly? Yeah. Okay. How about when you uh, watch TV in your dorm room and you're like, hey, come on in and watch this movie with me? Is that performing a copyrighted work publicly? Depends on who you're addressing. Who you're addressing. Good. Okay. <laughs> Fine. So no, it's also a very subtle issue. Number five. In the case of literary, musical, dramatic. So what kind of work, by the way, is not literary, musical, dramatic, choreographic, pantomime, or motion picture? What would be an example of something that's not one of those? What if you make like a nature recording? You know, like those soothing, like the massage CDs, where it's like ocean waves crashing? Well, you'd lose. <laughs> if you go out on the beach and you record ocean waves crashing or birds chirping or something, that's not literary, musical, dramatic, choreographic, pantomime, or a motion picture. So you can perform that publicly all you want. OK, so go on. And pictorial, graphic, or sculptural works, including the individual images of a motion picture or other audiovisual work to display the copyrighted work publicly. OK. So. The picture on the front of this DVD is a copyrighted picture, right? And I'm displaying it publicly. <laughs> Am I breaking the law? I think so. Yes, I think there's an exception. But tricky. OK, what's the last one? OK, what, so what's a sound recording? It's like ocean waves, or it's like the Britney Spears CD. It turns out the musical work uh, is like the sheet music to the Britney Spears song. So people know the song um, Baby One More Time. So who wrote that song? Who here has not heard the song? OK. You've all heard the song Baby One More Time? OK. And who wrote it? Somebody other than Caitlin. It's written by a guy, a, a Swedish guy named Martin Sandberg, and who goes by the name Max Martin. He wrote a lot of popular songs, um, many of them for Britney Spears. So he wrote the song. There's sheet music. You can buy it. A baby one more time. It's got the notes and the pedal and, the, and all that stuff. Um, but then Britney Spears then sang the song, and she recorded it. Uh, that's a sound recording. So, And Britney Spears owns the copyright maybe to the recording, but she doesn't own the copyright to the song, Baby One More Time. OK, so in the case of sound recordings. To perform the copyrighted work publicly. OK, that sounds a lot like the other one. Go on by means of a digital audio transmission. OK. So the ocean waves you can perform publicly, except by means of a digital audio transmission. So what's an example of a digital audio transmission? A CD, like how are you, what's the transmission? Like if you ship a CD in a moving van, <laughs> is that a digital audio transmission? It's, it's pretty arguable, right? The CD is digital, contains audio, <laughs> sort of transmitting it. I mean, there's laws about what you can transmit through the mail. You know, you can't transmit uh, cocaine through the mail. So can you transmit digital audio through the mail? Like a radio. What's a digital radio? 
Like, who would be affected by this? Would like 98, you know, 98.7 FM have to worry about that? If they have an internet station. If they have an internet station. OK, so it's music over the internet. And, and how about what else? Satellite. OK, those are digital. And there's also satellites that are not digital, right? So it gets, um, but like XM radio, that's digital. So Congress has legisl legislated here very particularly. They've said one set of rules apply to FM radio, because it's analog, and a different set of rules apply to things that are digital, like XM radio. So if, uh, you know, when, when the MIT radio station, does anybody here work with the radio station? When the MIT radio station plays Baby One More Time over the radio, do they have to get Britney Spears' permission? No. Do they have to pay any money to Britney Spears? It's analog. So when people are like, whoa, Britney, your song's at the top of the charts. You must be loaded. Is that true? No, because the, she doesn't get any money from the radio plays. And they don't have to get her permission. Does that seem fair? I mean, the radio station is selling advertisements. They say, tune in soon. Britney Spears is coming up. But for now, a special offer from the car company. Um, and then they play Britney Spears. Is that fair? What? OK, so it's not as good a copy. OK. Like, I, this is kind of a problem. Like, I never understood the problem with that. Because you're kind of giving them free advertising. Like, if you think about it, if someone's like, hey, that sounds pretty hot. I'm going to go to the show on that CD. Like, you know? Okay. So I, don't, I don't see what the problem ever was. Like, I, I mean, I, it's not. But, yeah. Okay. You can make also a case that digital does not have this rivalry property um, that analog does because of the de degrading nature of multiple copies. So analog, you can't keep making copy of copy of copy of copy. So eventually it runs out. But digital, you know, like if you dub a tape for somebody and then they dub it. Do people ever do this, dub tapes? No? Yeah, OK. And if you keep dubbing a tape, eventually it sounds pretty bad. But that's not the case with burning a CD. So OK. I mean, it, it doesn't totally seem fair to me. And in fact, in Europe, it's not the case. In Europe. The record, recording artist does get money from the radio, the, even the analog radio uh, transmission of their song. But in America, it's not like that. Um, people want to guess about why that is? Did Congress say, like, we don't like recording artists, so we're not going to let them get money from radio airplays? Well. It has to do with the historical development of copyright law, and it has to do with the fact that radio broadcasters are very powerful in, uh, in Congress. People have been following the saga of Mr. Abramoff. Mr. Abramoff, or Abramoff, Jack. He was, he was a lobbyist, and these people are hired by various industries to persuade Congress to pass laws one way or another, and the broadcasters are very powerful in, in persuading Congress. Sorry? Clear Channel? Clear Channel. Clear Channel is a company that owns many, many radio stations. And they're very good at, at uh, persuading Congress to do one thing or another. I still don't understand. Like, WMBR has webcasts. Yeah, well, those are different. We'll get to that. Do they pay for that? Yeah. They do? They do pay for the webcast. Well, they should pay for the webcast. I don't know if they actually do. But uh, they pay. I believe they pay $500 a year flat rate because of another law. <laughs> OK. So copyright is this bundle of rights. And everything else in the Copyright Act, the other 300 pages, stems from these six exclusive rights, sort of. Uh, but they all have exceptions. But when, you think, when somebody says, you're violating my copyright right, what's the next question you should ask? Which exclusive right am I violating? What am I doing? Because this is what copyright is. It's not something else. Is what I'm saying right now copyrighted? Oh, that was a bad question. We haven't gotten to that yet. But uh, anyway, I, my point is copyright is very specific in what it allows and what it prohibits. Um, and it goes on for 300 pages about how specific it is. 
notwithstanding that specificity, even like line number two there has all sorts of ambiguities, like about printf and about the frames and what, my other example. So we should be careful. And so for the homework, which will be on the web tonight. Oh, did we get the sign-up sheet, by the way? Who has, the, has everybody signed the sign-up sheet? Everybody signed this? Okay. So I'm going to assign some reading tonight. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to sign some reading tonight about some lawsuits that people have had about copyright. And uh, then we can talk about them in the next class. And so for the rest of today, oh, OK. I'll skip this for now. OK, so yes, my point was there's difficult questions in copyright. Like, for instance, if you stream something in real audio, have people used real audio or MP3 streaming? Um, now, it goes into the RAM of your computer, right? Is that a reproduction? Yes? Does anybody want to say no? Okay, so if you're streaming something via real audio, are you, is it being transmitted or is it also being reproduced? Both? Okay, maybe. It turns out to be a very difficult question. Uh, here's another one. Can you copyright a law? People here are, are course six, right? Some people? So people know about the National Electric Code? Is the National Electric Code a law? Do I have to obey the National Electric Code? Maybe municipalities incorporated by reference. Yeah, or not even by reference. They incorporate it. So yeah, I mean, in Massachusetts, so what, what's an example of something the National Electric Code says? It's like rules for electricians. So one of the things it says is like in a bathroom, if you want to put in an outlet, it has to have you know the little test and reset, those sorts of rules, and how you have to run wires. and it's really, really long, about electrical safety. And it's not written by legislatures. It's written by this group of experts. Um, and they put a lot of effort into it. And they copyright it. You can buy this book called The National Electric Code. And they tell municipalities and, and um, you know, cities and states, they say, adopt the National Electric Code. It's easier than making your own laws about electrical safety. And so many of them have. Um, and if somebody asks, you know, what's the law in, that I have to obey? And they say, I'm going to put it up on a website so people know the law. Does that violate the copyright of the owners of the National Electric Code? Does anybody want to say yes? You say yes? OK, does anybody say no? I can put up the law. You say no? OK, so that's another tricky question. That one was litigated. Here's number three. Sometimes I write articles for the tech. And then the tech contributes them to LexisNexis, which is an online database. Is that legal? Can the tech send my article to LexisNexis? Is it without your permission? Or... I, I haven't said anything on the subject. I don't have a contract with the tech. I just said, here, tech, you can print this in the tech. And then later they say, we're going to send everything in the tech to LexisNexis. Well, LexisNexis gets a copy of the tech. Does uh... LexisNexis benefit? Sure, people pay LexisNexis millions of dollars to subscribe to LexisNexis. Well, okay, so the New York Times had this problem, a newspaper of a lot more stature than the tech. They had freelancers contributing articles to the New York Times, and the New York Times was sending the New York Times to LexisNexis. And the freelancers sued. And the New York Times says, look, we have copyright on the whole New York Times, of which your article is only a small part. So we have the ability to send the New York Times to LexisNexis. And the freelancer says, no, 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 no. You're not sending the New York Times to LexisNexis. You're sending each article individually, including mine. And it went to the Supreme Court in, I think, 2001. The freelancers won. So, yeah, did the tech change it? So Michael is the managing the editor of the tech. The te so does, is the tech breaking the law, Michael? It's unclear. We don't send articles anywhere. Well, they end up in LexisNexis. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> On University Wire. You Wire is indirect, and I'm not sure they actually pull our articles right now. OK, well, the tech is breaking the law. That's my position. <laughs> Has in the past broken the law. Has in the past broken the law. OK. Uh, so when I buy a DVD like this one, Sneakers, uh, you know, do I have the authority to play it on any DVD player I want? No. OK, is that because it says something on the DVD? Which has to have like, particular region or maybe region. 
play around thing. Okay. So anyway, these are hard questions. Three of them have, have been litigated in court. One of them at the Supreme Court. The top one, nobody knows the answer to. Um, so you know, the point is there's difficult questions in copyright. So how do we answer these questions? How can we, how can we learn about copyright? Study previous cases, OK. How do we find out about previous cases? <laughs> OK, we're going to have a brief introduction to the law right now, so because th this will help you with the homework. Um, so let's talk about the federal government. We're going to switch gears here. What's the structure of the federal government? OK, there's three branches. And what are they? Legislature. OK, the legislative branch. What's the, and that's in Article 1 of the Constitution, right? What's the next one? Executive branch. OK. OK, so what's the major thing in the legislative branch, somebody other than Hung Yi? Congress. Congress. And who is in Congress? What does Congress mean? Like, are we in Congress? Houses of Congress. Yeah, but, yeah, so it means coming together. So Congress is all these people who are elected from all across our broad country who have come together to Washington. And in particular, they've come together in two groups. What are the groups? OK, the House of Representatives and the Senate. OK. And then the Senate's got all these committees, and the House has got all these committees. And there's other organizations that are part of the legislative branch. Can anybody name one? Yeah. What else is in the legislative branch other than the House of Representatives and the Senate? Yeah, this is just, we're just talking about the federal government. So there's like the Library of Congress. The Government Accountability Office. Have people been to the Library of Congress? It's pretty majestic. Part of Congress. OK. Um, so then there's the executive branch. Who's the, what's the major thing in the executive branch? The president. OK. What's something else in the executive branch? The, cap so they, when the cabinet, you mean the departments. So there's like the Department of what's the department that gets the most money? Yeah, Social Security may be right, but I don't actually know. Let's say defense. And what's another one? The one that literally gets the most money would be the Treasury. <laughs> and what are some other ones? Yeah, agriculture. I don't even know what they do. OK, so they have all these, these departments. What's an, and if the president wants to like fire somebody in one of these departments, can they do it? Generally, yes. These people basically work for the president. What's something else that's in the executive branch? Oh, by the way, who in the executive branch is actually elected? And who else? The vice president. And these are basically the only people who are elected in the whole executive branch. Um, and about how much money every year does the legislative branch get? N not a lot. How much money does the executive branch get? A lot. Like how much? Two trillion. Two trillion, yeah. Two. Two trillion, yeah. So this is by far the most like expensive branch. Okay, what else is in the executive branch other than these departments? Uh, that's actually part of the Department of Justice. The FBI is under them. What was that? No.
military? The military is part of the Department of Defense. That's like the Pentagon. There's these other government agencies that are sort of separate, like the Federal Communications Commission and the Federal Election Commission and some other ones. So these people are part of the federal government, but they don't really work for the president. They're sort of appointed. There's the Securities and Exchange Commission. There's these sort of people sometimes call this the fourth branch of government. Um, because they're, they're in the executive branch, but they don't really work for the president, at least not as, di as directly. OK, that's the executive branch. So if you commit a crime, who comes after you? A federal crime. Who? The Department of Justice, right. And what are those people called? The feds. The feds. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> the feds. First, the FBI comes after you. Those are the investigators. And then you get indicted by a prosecutor, all in the Department of Justice. OK. And then do they just indict you? And then like, you're indicted, you have to go to jail? No. OK. And it, when they indict you, by the way, what gives them the authority to do that? Like, they indict you for littering. Uh, is there somewhere where it's written that that's against the law? Yes. There's a law written by these guys. So these guys write the law. These guys enforce the law. And who says you're guilty or, or something else? The judicial branch, which is in Article 3. OK. And what's the major dude in that? Major dude debts and dudes? The Supreme Court. OK. And what's below the Supreme Court? There's appeals courts, circuit courts of appeals which are divided around the country. So the one that governs Massachusetts is called the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And there's lots, there's like uh, 11 circuits. Out in, on the West Coast, there's the Ninth Circuit, which is called the Out of Control Circuit. It's also the, by far the biggest one. And we're actually the smallest one in the First Circuit. Um, and then what's under the appeals? So who's on the appeals court? Are they justices or just lawyers? They're called circuit judges. And the people on the Supreme Court serve for life. The people on the appeals court serve also for life. And below the appeals court is what? The district courts. So we're here in the District of Massachusetts. So if you got indicted for mail fraud, you'd go before a judge in Boston at the place where the, they had the ring premiere. Anybody was there? <laughs> at the federal court. You'd go before a district judge who's appointed for life, like Judge Young. And you'd have a trial. And at the end, uh, what will happen? They issue a ruling, right. And how do, you, how do you find out about the ruling? How does the, anybody in the public find out? Do, do you have a right to go to the, somebody else's court hearing? Yes. You can almost always just walk in there and sit in on people's court hearings. But if, you're not, if you don't happen to be there, how would you find out about the decision? The opinion is released. So the judge labors for hours. Actually, his clerk labors for hours and hours. Sorry. And at the end, they write an opinion. Uh, and how do you find out about the opinion? It's in the court record. Do you have to actually go to the court to see it? Often. Sometimes they're online. Yeah. So officially, when a, when a court opinion is important, the judge says, this should be published. Uh, and then they're, they're, they're published in these books that are called reporters. And the reporters are put in law libraries, and also on LexisNexis, which is an online database that we're going to use in this class. So, uh, and the, re the reporters, are, I should bring one in, but they come out with these books. They're like 1,000 pages. And they come out like every week with all the new opinions. And the one that, they're, that the federal district courts are published in is called the Federal Supplement. And it's abbreviated like this. Um, and every week, there's a new 
book of the federal supplement. And actually, they've done so many federal supplements that they, you know, so the, you might get this week, you might get, you know, federal supplement book number 229 that they write at the front. And when they got up to 1,000, they decided there's too many federal supplements. We're going to start the numbering over again. So they created what's called the Federal Supplement Second Series. <laughs> um, and this format, this is the site. We talked about citations at the very beginning. This is ultra, unfortunately ultra important uh, because LexisNexis accepts only one format. So the fact that you have to have a space in here, for instance, um, the lawyers are, if you go to law school, there will be these kids who are like, super prickly about this stuff. And they wear bow ties and stuff like that. And they edit the law review. But also LexisNexis is prickly about it. So that's why we're going to talk about citations briefly. So it's in the, so if you want to talk about a case, that the opinion was published in the federal supplement. By the way, is the federal supplement free? No. It's published by this company called West, which is owned by a different company called Thompson. They don't have a deal. Anybody can publish these. But uh, so West and LexisNexis are actually uh, competitors. But uh, the way that people talk about the opinions is to talk about where they are in West's books. So OK, so if you want to talk about an opinion, you'd say it was in book 229 of the Federal Supplement second series. And then it's like a 1,000 page book. So what else might you want to add? The page number, exactly. So you give the page number on which the thing starts. So this is called a citation. Uh, and often you might want to say, like, who is arguing? So you put at the beginning, Jones versus Smith, and a comma. But this is not the important part. This is the important part. And then at the end, you put like the year in which it was decided. It's also not really the important part. But the part you really need if you want to find a case is this middle part. And when we read opinions in this class, they will be riddled with citations because judges never like to go out on a limb. And as I said at the beginning, the judge can't say, well, my law professor told me, or Keith told me, or uh, Snail told me. You, know, you, you, you can't say that. You have to give some authority, some reason, uh, for the proposition that you're stating. Now, is this true in science? In science, can you cite to authority? Can you be like, F equals MA because Newton says so? Be like, 3 Newton, 17. Does that work? Yeah. But the ultimate authority in science is not like important people, like the Supreme Court of Science. In science, the important the, the, you know, reality is important, uh, and the ability to reproduce experiments. That's not true in the law. In the law, authorities are important. So this you know, argument to authority, which is a fallacy in science, is like the way things are done in the law. And the Supreme Court is the ultimate authority. OK, so you, you have your opinion here. Um, and let's say you lost. Let's say you're Smith, and you lost, and the judge wrote it and it was published. And what do you do? You appeal. Now, can you appeal and be like, you know, the witness said I was crossing the street, but I wasn't? Is that a reason you can appeal? No. What sorts of things can you appeal? Legal, legal questions. So the, the, the district court, except in extraordinary circumstances, this lowest court is generally supreme on factual circumstances, factual questions. But on legal questions, like, did they do things the right way or or let's say we agree on the facts. I was crossing the street, but you could say, even if I did what you say I did, it still didn't violate the law. Those kinds of questions you can appeal. And you'd go to an appeals court. We also have one in Boston. It's actually in the same courtroom, the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And there's only like six judges on it. It's very small. Um, and you'd argue your case before the uh, appeals, uh, the circuit judges. Now, how long would like a trial last? People watch the OJ trial. Is that two years? So a, a trial could last weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But an appeal lasts about an hour. So things get really whittled down by the time you get to the appeal. The judges say, now we're going to hear case, this case. And your lawyer argues for maybe half an hour, and the other lawyer argues for maybe half an hour, and they say, thank you. 
And then a few months later, they issue their decision. So the appeal is really better be important for you to bring it up in your appeal. Uh, and you don't argue before the entire appeals court, all six judges. You argue just before three of them. It's called a panel. So OK, so they, they finish up and they publish their opinion. And whereas it's published also in a book by West called The Federal Reporter. And that's abbreviated F. <laughs> but they had so many of them that they started the numbers over. So now we're on The Federal Reporter third series. So something might be published in book 112, F3rd, page number 967. And you'd have the same thing, Jones versus Smith. And actually, you're, you know, you're supposed to say not just the year, but also what court decided it. So this might be the district court for Massachusetts in 2001. By the time you appeal, you're saying it's the first circuit court of appeals in, let's say, 2002. OK, so you're still pissed off. You lost again. You're Smith, and you appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, can you directly appeal to the Supreme Court? No. They have to pick you. So you can't actually, in, in almost all cases, you cannot appeal to the Supreme Court. There's a very slim category where you can. But normally, you can't appeal to the Supreme Court. You just have to petition. You, you say, please, take my case. It's sort of like petitioning to the Committee on Academic Probation here at MIT. You, they don't have to grant your request. You petition. So you petition to the Supreme Court, and let's say they grant it. So now you're at the Supreme Court, and you petition for what's called certiorari, which means they hear your case. So you're up there. Your lawyer's up there. So you have to fly to Washington, DC. And it's even more whittled down, because they only take like 1% of the cases that are petitioned to them. And you're in front of nine justices in Washington. It's not just part of the court. It's the whole court. And your lawyer gets up there and he says, um, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my client did not break the law because, and you know, he starts talking. And then you know, the justices will be like, but isn't it true that you know, they interrupt you and it's very aggressive? Has anybody heard the Supreme Court or listened to the transcripts? If you go to oye.org. I think that, or you can listen to the transcripts of the Supreme Court. They're, they're very aggressive. You would never, I would never make it through because they're like, isn't it true? Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> so you argue before the nine justices, and they say, OK, the case is submitted. You get an hour. Um, and they, they only want to hear the most important issues of the case and only the federal issues. And then, OK, then nine months later, they issue a decision. And that's also published. And the Supreme Court feels it's so important. Uh, they don't want to leave it to West or some other company to publish these decisions. They publish them themselves. So they're published. So this time, if Smith was losing, so you'll see this, so don't get tripped up by this. If Smith was losing, he's the petitioner now, because he, he's the one that asked the Supreme Court to take the case. So when the Supreme Court rules on it, it'll be written like this, Smith versus Jones. So you'll see these names get flipped around. Don't, don't let it fool you. It just means that this is the guy that petitioned the Supreme Court, probably because he's the one that lost on the lower stage. And then it'll be something like 592 United States, page number 112. Now, West also publishes its own reporter of Supreme Court cases that comes out much quicker. This takes like two years to come out. So in the two years after a decision comes out, you might see people refer to it instead by um, the West uh, citation, which looks like this. They do SCT, which is that's just their private publication. It's the exact same text. It's just this one comes out quicker. So don't, don't be confused by that. And then at the end, because they're so important, you don't even have to put which court decided it. Because it's in US, they're so cool, you just put 2003. And you're like, wow. Now, why is it important to observe these distinctions? Uh, it's because when you, when you write something with citations, the reader will understand what you're talking about. If you say, well, I should be right. Uh, you should believe me because of this case. It was decided. And you cite something to F sub 2D, they'll be like, huh, just a district court. Who cares? If you cite it to something in F, they'll be like, oh, wow, that's more important. And especially if it's in the same circuit as where you, you're, you, you are, uh, then it has really important authority. And if you can cite to the Supreme Court and have US, then you're like, wow, that's like the most powerful kind of authority at all. So 
the citations have a communicative effect in that they tell you what court issued it, when they issued it, and, uh, and so you, you have to be able to understand the clues that are in there to be able to pull things up. So I'm going to show very briefly how to pull something up on LexisNexis, and then the homework will be to pull things up on LexisNexis and read them. I'll, I'll put that on the website and email you. So do I have a Netscape here? So is everybody, well, I'll show you in a second. Coming up. There it is. Okay, so MIT has a subscription to this online database called LexisNexis, uh, which, you know, contains all of the text of the West reporters since, you know, the, before the founding of America, and all sorts of other interesting stuff. So to get there, you can, let, I'll show you, we go to libraries, at MIT edu, and Vera eJournals and Databases, Lexus. Okay, here we go. Lexus Nexus Academic. So you click on that, and if you're off campus, you have to click over here on this Go. Okay, so that takes us here to web.lexus-nexus.com/universe, which you can just go to. So let's say we want to look up a Supreme Court case. So what's that site? So we go to Legal Research, and we can go to Get a Case. And here you put in the citation. So what should we look up? Let's look up Marbury versus Madison. People know that case? OK, so one way to do it, you can type in here. If you don't know the citation, Marbury versus Madison. You say search, and there it is. Or uh, if you know the citation, which you should, because everybody will give it, you type the citation. And that also comes up with the same thing. So let's look at a more recent case. Uh, here was one about. Detaining Nazi spies. There we go. Okay. So this dude was a Nazi spy. They locked him up. He didn't get a trial. Is that okay? It was in 1942. Went to the Supreme Court. So, and here's the case. So at the beginning, they have these little explanations. Well, let's see what they have. I'm going to talk more about this next time. So at the beginning, they have a syllabus here, which is always very helpful, because they give a little summary of the case, the Supreme Court. Sometimes they'll also have a thing called summary, too. Here they have some more stuff. But the part that's important is the part that starts with opinion. And here you can see what the Supreme Court actually wrote. These cases are brought here by blah, 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 blah. And then in the middle, they may have a citation. So they'll be like, see this case, United States x rel Skimeka versus Husband. And they'll give us this. Now, what does this mean here? It's an appeal score, right, because it's an F. So we can plug that in to get a So if you want to learn what's, what's going on there, you can plug that in to get a case. And you say search. And there's the new case. So it's sort of like hyperlinks, except you have to copy and paste. <laughs> and in some parts of LexisNexis and in the commercial version of LexisNexis, they turn these into hyperlinks. And then when you click it, they charge you five bucks in the commercial version because they, they really want to, anyway, they want to make it easier for you to be lazy and also then they charge you money. But anyway, so I will, I'm going to put online a bunch of citations and the assignment will be to put them into LexisNexis and read the cases and be able to talk about them in the next class. Okay, did anybody have any quick questions? Yeah. Federal government. Uh, yeah. You can't challenge the law without, say, being like, arrested for it. Or can you just challenge a law that no one's can you, question is, can you challenge a law even if you haven't yet been prosecuted? And the answer is yes. Uh, for instance, um, there was a law that was passed in 1996 that said you can't put pornography on the internet. Now, is pornography protected by the First Amendment? 
Yes, pornography is protected. Most pornography is protected by the First Amendment. And Congress says you can't put porn, porn on the Internet. And so a bunch of organizations sued the government before they'd even been prosecuted. And they said, we're not saying we did put porn on the Internet, and we're not saying we didn't put porn on the Internet. But what we are saying is that this is chilling our speech. And this law is overbroad, and it's unconstitutional. So they, and so they, they filed that lawsuit, and they actually won. And the case is called Reno versus ACLU. Does that mean that Reno, who's Reno? Janet Reno, the Attorney General. Does it mean that she sued the ACLU? Right, it meant that she had lost at the lower court. So she was now petitioning the Supreme Court to take the case. So yes, so you, you can sue without having to actually be prosecuted. Sometimes. Anything else? Okay. Oh, your forms. Well, give them to Alicia.